In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondocast. Welcome everyone to a very special Vunda Blast episode of the Vunda Cast. I am your host, D Rock World Heavyweight Champion, and I would like to discuss with you, or really with myself, a takeover on Saturday. We had a SummerSlam on Sunday, and we also had the final of the G1 Climax 29 tournament for New Japan Pro Wrestling. Also on Sunday at 11 p.m. Pacific Time, there was a lot of wrestling going on this weekend, and I kind of want to see if I can try to just run through it as quickly as I can, because it's just me, and I want to try to keep this under 20 or 30 minutes, but I'm already at one and a half right now, so we'll see how that goes. So let's just get right into it, since I'm trying to get this, through this as fast as I can. TakeOver Toronto was an awesome show. It was weirdly not super well received by a lot of people that I think look for different things from wrestling than I do. Started with the tag team match that opened the show was pretty much your standard amazing tag team wrestling match that they have at pretty much every takeover now. It wasn't anything particularly special, but it was a lot of fun. It was really well done. Tag team wrestling, as NXT tag team wrestling always is. Street Profits are great. Champions, Undisputed Era, got to look good too. It's good to see Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly finally tagging together for the first time in a while. Actually, the first time in a while was the ladder match, but this is the second time. So, good to see them get some get some airtime. Good match, you know, nothing particular to talk about, but good stuff. Uh, Moving on to Io Shirai versus Candice LeRae. This, to me, was the match of the night. This was the show stealer. This was one of the best matches of the entire year, largely because Io Shirai is a fucking badass. And this is kind of the this this dark version of Io Shirai, the kind of heel version that's been coming out ever since the cage match has been excellent. And the whole the whole character arc has been really good. If you haven't seen that cage match, go watch go back and watch it. Io Shirai versus Shayna Baszler in the steel cage on NXT TV for the NXT Women's Championship. It was also one of the best matches of the year in my opinion at least in wwe wwe slash nxt amazing match amazing ending i love the ending where io hits Shayna with the cage door so many times that she gets knocked out and falls out of the cage to win the match great stuff Sorry for the spoiler if you haven't seen it already, but it's been several weeks now, so. In this match, the great thing was that Io Shirai really got to look like a million bucks. She really got to look like the badass wrestler that she is, just dragging Candice LeRae for most of this match. And it was really, really cool, really impressive, and... Candice LeRae got to look great also. She got to, you know, she took a major ass kicking. She came back over and over. There were definitely points where it looked like she could win the match. It was just really excellently done. What I really love to see from this angle going forward is, I think, so I was thinking about this a little bit, I would love to see Candice and Io and Shayna each put together a team for 
a first ever women's war games match for the next takeover which is takeover war games i think that would be really cool and then to have candace pick up a pin over io shirai would then lead into hopefully another match perhaps at a takeover for the number one contendership to the women's championship in that match i would love to see i'd love to see where candace is about to win and io shirai has a moment like Asuka had when she was facing Ember Moon, and Ember Moon was about to win, and Asuka said, screw this, and she cheated to win. And I would love Io Shirai to have that moment where she realizes, "Uh uh-oh, Candice is going to beat her, and she has to cheat. And she gets the title shot, she wins the title at the TakeOver Royal Rumble, and then that sets up a big WrestleMania weekend match for Io Shirai, and Candice LeRae, preferably, honestly, I would love to see it be in the main event of TakeOver WrestleMania. Women have main evented pay-per-views in NXT, but they have never main evented TakeOver WrestleMania. So I would love to see that. Next up was Pete Dunne versus Roderick Strong versus Velveteen Dream for the North American Championship, which was also a show stealer. It's hard to even pick which of those two matches, the one before this or this one, really stole the show, but I still go with Io and Candice, I think. But this match was also stunning. All three of these guys got to really look like a million bucks. Particularly Roderick Strong has been looking really great in his last two, at least his last two takeover matches. The last one with against Matt Riddle, he looked very strong, pun intended. And this one he got to look really good too, it's, which is great because it's really easy to forget how good Roderick Strong is at this wrestling thing. It's not that hard to forget how good Pete Dunne is. And Velveteen Dream, he gets by a lot on character, but to me, he is also one of the best pure wrestlers, just as an old school type of wrestler. Like, I would love to see Velveteen Dream take on Cody, because they would have such a great old school NWA style match. But I digress. So this match was great. I loved the finish. The best, that was the best stealing a pin spot that I've ever seen. And in part because it was the most logical I've ever seen. Especially in a triple threat match. Because usually when a guy steals a pin, he just throws a guy out and steals the pin. This time, what they did was so genius. They had one guy, I think I think Velveteen Dream originally tried to steal the pin and then Roderick Strong no Velveteen Dream was going for the pin and Roderick Strong threw him off and hit his finisher and went for his own pin and then Velveteen Dream did his elbow drop off the top rope finisher to break up that pin and put it into his own pin and he won the match and that's just I mean that's just perfect I love it I love the the logic of it. I love the heightened action in that from the normal kind of spot that this is. So that was excellent. Jaina Baszler versus Mia Yim. So I have been a very much a Mia Yim apologist for a while. I, I really never understood why she got so much shit about her ring work. I thought her ring work up until this point has been actually pretty good. And this match has me rethinking that. She really did not... She looked like she was not ready for the spotlight. And it really showed... This is the first time in a really long time... A really long time... I can't remember the last time a match landed so poorly. And was so... It was so silent at a takeover. I can't remember a a crowd ever being that silent for a takeover match. I can't remember when the last time was. There have been matches that haven't been particularly interesting, but nothing like this. I mean, it's just the, the botches and the weird character work of Mia Yim apparently feeling like she needs to start cheating now when she's never done that in the past. 
I think that confused the fans, and the match was already, you know, Shayna Baszler matches are slow anyway, because that's how she wrestles, she's a heel, so she tends to slow the match down, which is a heel wrestling tactic designed to piss people off, and I wish more people realized that, instead of giving all this nonsense about how somebody like Shayna Baszler is a bad wrestler, she's not, she's a great wrestler, she understands this so well, but she's a heel. And part of being a heel is that you wrestle in such a way that it will make people angry and make people dislike you. And so that combined with the botches, combined with the weird character work, just made this match really not land well at all. One of the worst takeover matches, in my memory at least, which is unfortunate. It feeds a lot of the Shayna haters. It feeds the Mia haters which I'm still not 100% convinced that I was wrong about Mia, but this performance was not encouraging for somebody like me who has been standing for Mia Yim for a while. So we'll see what happens with that, but I I don't think... I think that Mia Yim should be removed from the title picture for the time being. I don't think she's ready. I don't think she's ready for, for big time, and which is, you know, she proved at TakeOver. Finally, the wrestling conversation that we've all been having since this past weekend, or one of them anyway. Adam Cole and Johnny Gargano in a three stages of heck match. Um, I, I joked about that on, on Twitter because it's a three sta- it's what they're doing is a three stages of hell match, but clearly they decided they needed to call it a two out of three falls match because we can't say hell anymore, I guess, because it's PG, although, you know, I don't know. Although, like, and at the same time, like, the they did the third fall in this, like, barbed wire weapons cage, which also really doesn't work that well when they still insist on not using blood. I mean, you can't have barbed wire and brain a guy on the back of a chair. Jesus, that spot was gruesome. Or looked gruesome, I'm sure it wasn't that bad. But you, that Adam Cole's gotta bleed there. He's got to. It doesn't make sense. It takes you out of the illusion otherwise to see... A guy gets split in the face. Like, if that la- if that move landed for real in the way that we're supposed to believe it did in kayfabe, he would have been split open. There's no way around it. Even the sound of it. So, yeah, that was a big part. That, that didn't help. But also, this match, I mean, their first match, I think both... It's, I, I think it la- it's definitely both of the... Two out of three falls matches brought out the worst tendencies of both of these guys. And they were, I mean, it was just a false finish festival, you know? It was just falsies after falsies after fall, like, just, just kicking out of everything. And at some point, it just, it really kills your suspension of disbelief. I think the match in between those two the single fall that Adam Cole won the title was the best of the three because it was limited on some of that. There was still some of it in there, but it wasn't to the level where you really started to notice it. And I feel like, and a lot of people are getting on Johnny's case for this, Johnny Gargano, that this is something that he does all the time. And... To be honest, I've never felt that way about Johnny Gargano's matches until these this trilogy of matches with Adam Cole. I've always felt that he definitely has the fighting spirit thing going on, you know? But he's always made it work. The potency of the storytelling is part of what made it work. That context given to the fact that he's willing to kick out of so many things because the emotion is is so there, particularly the matches with Tommaso Ciampa, it really gave a much richer context. But in these matches, there was no real story between these two guys other than they both want the NXT Championship. And, you know, that'll only take you so far when you're starting to kick out of avalanche destroyers and just... Like, all kinds of stuff. It just, 
kills the sus- suspension of disbelief, for me at least. A lot of people thought that match was the greatest thing they've ever seen. You know, thought it was the, the, the match of the night by far. Some people thought it was the only good match on the card, which I don't understand at all. I mean, I do, I guess, but, like, I just... You know, it's so easy to say, I'm going to kick out of all of this stuff, you know? The wrestlers decide, or somebody decides, what they're going to kick out of and what they're not going to kick out of. And if you don't make those decisions judiciously, if you just kick out of everything to give a match heightened drama and momentum, it's too easy. Anyone could just do that. Anyone could do that over and over and over. Anyone with the stamina could go for 50, 60, 70 minutes or whatever and just keep kicking out of all the things. It's something that I have a love-hate relationship with in New Japan. Not so much kickouts, but like no selling. Kills my suspension of disbelief and people love it. People love that shit. People love it when guys just shrug off a big move and just, like, it's nothing. And to me, it just lowers the stakes of those moves. It makes those moves not mean... It makes them mean less. It doesn't make them not mean anything, but it makes them mean less. And I want every move to matter. It's like, you know, if you look at, like, some of the Rhodes Brothers matches... These last two matches, Cody and Cody versus Dustin, and then the two of them versus the Young Bucks, every move in those matches mattered. I mean, that's what that that bruising, slow, storytelling-heavy NWA style is all about, making everything count. Everything means something. And that's so much more compelling to me than a match where guys are just shrugging off moves, kicking out of everything, just, I mean, I place a very high premium in wrestling on how realistic it looks, and not everybody does that, and it's unfortunate to me, but that's what people like, and who am I to say that they're right or wrong about that? Anyway, we'll get into that a little bit more when I start on start in on G1, because there's quite a bit of that. But let's turn our attention to SummerSlam for a minute here. The opinions that people have had about SummerSlam seem to be wildly varied, which is interesting. I felt like this was one of the best, one of the best non-NXT WWE pay-per-view events, top to bottom of the card that I have seen in quite some time. It was definitely the best SummerSlam since at least 2013. It was maybe the best SummerSlam since 2002. Like, I mean, I haven't watched them, but of the ones I've watched, this is the best since at least 2013. I felt like every single match, with very few caveats, every single match was at least either good or effective. And most of them were both. The Becky versus Natalia match. I had been trying to tell people all week. People drag Natalia a lot. And yes, she does have some very shitty matches with less than great wrestlers. But when she's in there with somebody like Becky or somebody like Charlotte or somebody who is a great wrestler, she is more than capable of having great matches. She knows what goes into having great matches. She just has tends to have some kind of awkward timing with lesser wrestlers, I think, is the biggest, is is what it really boils down to. Her match with Charlotte at one of the early NXT takeovers, it was the finals of the uh, tournament to crown a new champion because Paige had just relinquished the title because she had won the Divas Championship at the time on her first night on Raw. That was a Great match. I think I would still probably consider that to be Natalia's best match. A lot of people are saying that they think that this was Natalia's best match, and it's definitely up there. This was a really good match, submission match. 
They did some really awesome stuff. I wasn't a huge fan of there being no rope breaks in this match, but huge caveat for that is that what that stipulation allowed them to do was very much worth it. If there's a purpose to changing the rules around and bending them and forgetting them and that kind of thing, then I'm a little bit more forgiving of something like that. When it leads to something like that sharpshooter on the turnbuckles, I'll, I'll let a little bit more slide, you know what I mean? So that match was great. I initially kind of hated the... I mean, obviously I hate any Goldberg match just for existing in 2019. And I, um, you know... My immediate reaction was to hate this match, largely because I was hoping that something else was going to happen at some point, and rather than this just being what it was, which is just Goldberg running over Dolph Ziggler a couple times. But in retrospect, it was what it needed to be. Goldberg redeemed himself. Yay, good for him. I may hate Goldberg, and sometimes it seems like I'm the only one but this is what it needed to be, and Ziggler was the perfect guy for this. I mean, nobody sells a spear quite like Dolph Ziggler, and he sold the hell out of those spears. And showed fighting spirit also, for what it's worth. I mean, he still got destroyed, but he he showed a little bravery, so I think that counts for something. The AJ Styles versus Ricochet match for the U.S. title. I thought this match was really good. It's becoming clear to me more and more the more I see AJ wrestle that he doesn't seem to be able to wrestle at the same pace that he once was able to. And it's started to... I mean, it's. It, I think that's a big part of why so many of his matches over the past year or two, maybe, I can't remember exactly how long it's been, have been a little bit lackluster, a little bit disappointing. Feels like it started with the Nakamura matches, but at some point there, he stopped. I stopped seeing him as the best wrestler on the planet and more as a guy who really knows what he's doing but isn't the special talent that he maybe once was, not even that long ago. Um, but I really liked this match. I felt like it played to both guys' strengths really well. There was, you, you know, we got to see some insane ricochet spots walking on the shoulders of the club. The springboard splash on one foot was incredible. Ricochet is just an impossible human being. I don't understand how it's even possible for him to do the things that he does and I also felt like AJ came in with the most logical possible strategy to beat Ricochet, take out his leg, and he did that, and Ricochet was able to find ways around it, which is also genius, but ultimately got caught by AJ's experience. The finish was beautiful, and yeah, I thought it was great. Moving on to Bailey and Ember, this is weird, because... And so, uh, according to a friend of mine, this isn't a one-time thing. The the Canadian crowds, for some reason, it seems, have always kind of had it in for Bailey, and that just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I don't know. The match I thought was really good, and the crowd was just like openly shitting on it, and it was really weird. I liked the match. Kind of sour at the Toronto crowd for ruining it. To be honest, it was good, but you'd never know that by by the crowd reaction. So next up was Kevin Owens versus Shane McMahon. This is another match that I also despised just for existing because I am tired of Shane McMahon being in pay-per-view matches in 2019. But from a character and st storytelling perspective, it worked. It did work. The crowd was super into it. Both guys did a great job orchestrating that crowd response, and I thought it worked really well. Next up was Charlotte versus Trish Stratus, which was really cool, and Trish looked good. Not great, but she looked really good. And I also love that they basically made this like a Brock Lesnar match. Charlotte basically dominated through most of the match. Trish got some 
good hope spots in. She almost beat Charlotte with her own move, which was classic. But Charlotte ultimately, of course, as she had to, defeated Trish Stratus with the figure eight. So that was really good. Kofi Kingston versus Randy Orton for the WWE Championship. This is another match that I was kind of eh, a little eh about. I was I, I, I was interested the, with the idea that a big part of the story that they were telling was based on that clip of Randy Orton when he RKO'd Kofi Kingston years ago out of one of those classic uh, jumping nothings that people always do into RKO's. And he, like, paces around the ring yelling, Stupid! Stupid! And so what they did is they kind of played on that, and part of the story was that Randy Orton actually does think that Kofi Kingston is stupid. And then... Oh, man, now I'm forgetting exactly how they did this, but they had a moment where Kofi did do something similar he he jumped went where he did jump into another RKO and you could see Randy Orton have that reaction of like yep he's stupid i knew it i knew he would do that because he's stupid and as soon as that happened Kofi Kingston rolled out of the ring which was very smart so he did something stupid and then as soon as Randy Orton thought that his point was validated about Kofi Kingston being stupid, he did something very smart. Rolled out of the ring, they fought on the outside, I think they got counted out or disqualified, I don't even know what the, 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 cl- the ending of the match was a little bit of a clusterfuck. I don't know, if, if it was a disqualification, if it was a count out, then that's just bullshit, like, let them keep fighting until Kofi gets out the, the kendo stick, and if you're gonna have them do that, then end it by, de- by by disqualification by doing that. The ending was weird and convoluted when it didn't need to be. But otherwise, I thought this was pretty effective. And the match was, was pretty good, actually. Better than I expected, you know? Next up, Bray Wyatt versus Finn Balor. So, this is another one of those matches that was highly effective, obviously, mostly because we, we finally got to see The Fiend do his entrance and to compete in the ring, and that shit was hot fire. I mean, the entrance was... <clears throat> the entrance was the thing that everybody was talking about after SummerSlam. I mean, the lantern made out of Bray Wyatt's head... And the remix of Broken Down in Love, and just everything. It was just so good. And then to have him basically just squash Finn Balor, I thought was also perfect. That's what needed to happen. This, particularly for someone like Bray Wyatt, who has been so, has had his legs taken out from under him so much over the course of his career by taking losses to so many of the people that he's feuded with. He needed a very decisive win. He needs to... This needs to be Bray Wyatt's demon, where he, like, can't lose when he's the fiend. I think that would be kind of the perfect way to rehab the Bray Wyatt character. Or the new, I mean, just rehab Bray Wyatt as a wrestler with a new character. So hopefully they keep that shit up, because that was great. Finally, we have the main event, Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship. It was really good. It was a really good match. Really, really good match. Call back to other matches that they've had, particularly the triple threat with Cena at the Royal Rumble in 2015 with that elbow drop spot that Seth did. I tend to agree with some people who were saying that because Brock had spent the last several weeks just, like, completely destroying Seth Rollins' ribs, that the suspension of disbelief here was a little hard to keep up. I felt like it worked better than some other people did, and it was a really good match. But, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. That was SummerSlam. Really, really good top to bottom. 
I really I enjoyed every match, and that's something that very rarely I get to say about a non NXT WWE pay per view. Shifting gears a little bit, I want to start talking about New Japan because I have been watching a ton of New Japan recently, a ton of the G One. That's really specifically. I've been I I have done some catching up with shows before that, some of the New Japan Cup and Dominion and a couple of other matches. But mainly I've been catching up on the G1 and the G1 was oh, it it, it was it was excellent. I mean, there is just so much good wrestling here. You know, and I was not as huge a fan of some of the matches that other people other people were. I kind of tend to look for different things from New Japan than some other people do, but they do a, a good enough job of everything at different times, but they do a good enough job of everything. I think New Japan right now would probably be my favorite promotion because they just have so much great talent. They have so many great matches. They have some tendencies that are not my favorite, but we'll get into that. So I want to start with G1 in Dallas because I just so happened to have been in attendance with my very own sister, best friend, person, Renee. We attended I, I I flew to Dallas where my friend Renee lives and stayed with her for a couple weeks and we went to the G1 show in Dallas and it was excellent it was so the only other New Japan show that I've attended in person was about a year before this the G1 special in San Francisco and to me this show was head and shoulders better than the G1 in San Francisco. G1 in San Francisco is good. This was much better. There were at least three matches, maybe four, that I would give four and a half stars to that were just very, very good. They're, they're not even close to the top 10 or even 20 matches uh, I've seen in New Japan this year, but they were very, very good. Ibushi Kenta... I thought was excellent. Some other people didn't agree as much, but I, I really liked it. Sonata and Zack Sabre Jr. was also excellent. And, you know, of course, getting to see Kazuchika Okada and Hiroshi Tanahashi live and in person was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And you you could... It was obvious from how excited the crowd was by it. I mean, we were we were so excited to see this match. It was really unbelievable. So that was awesome. And then, so I'm going to kind of go through and highlight a couple of matches that I thought were really, really good or that played into particular... Or play into particular stories or points that I want to make. Just some highlights to kind of give an overarching view, an overarching analysis of the G1 and the stories and the matches and everything. So I'm going to start with Tomohiro Ishii and Jay White had one of the most underrated matches, in my opinion, of the G1. In part because... Jay White. I feel like I I am such a Jay White stan at this point. He is I just think he's so good at this, so great at wrestling and character. He's so great at doing all the little things, at making everything look real. He has a great arsenal. He's great at transitions and pacing and timing. He's excellent and I really don't understand why he gets as much hate as he does. Um because it's not like genuine heel hate. It's not good hate, you know? People really, really don't like him as a wrestler. And I don't get it. I think he's great. Another big part of why I love this match so much is I've been saying pretty much since his match with Kenny Omega where he won the U.S. title that the Jay White character, to me, is pretty clearly a pain slut. If you look at some of his matches, go back and look at some some of his matches... At some point, after 15, 20, 25 minutes of just getting annihilated and just turned into hamburger meat by his opponent, sometimes he will just, like, look up at them and smile. 
And to me, that says masochist. And it explains a lot about why Jay White is able to kick out of so much of what he kicks out of. Because in no other way does he seem like somebody who's strong enough to kick out of some of the stuff that he kicks out of. But the idea that he enjoys the pain, then you get to a point where you can't hurt him bad enough to make him not get up. You have to, like, knock him out. You have to incapacitate him. You can't just hurt him bad enough to make him, to keep him down. You have to, you have to put him out. It's a great little character, I think. I also kind of want to take this opportunity to talk about the mixed feelings I have about Tomohiro Ishii because it's interesting. I, I either really like his matches or they just leave me feeling cold because his matches, probably more than anybody else's, are very heavy on strong style, which means a lot of no-selling. It's a lot of the kind of bulls running into each other over and over and over the shoulder tackle battles and the forearm battles and that kind of thing. I really feel like New Japan tends to go to that well a little too often, and it's particularly true in Ishii matches. Sometimes it's really well done and it's incredibly compelling and dramatic, and other times it's just really overdone and takes me out of the moment. So those are my feelings on Ishii. I still like him a lot. He's He is one of the guys that I always want to watch his matches because they always could be really excellent if they're done right. The next two matches I was going to, or two or three actually matches that I wanted to highlight, particularly for the wrestling conversation that is Will Ospreay, I wanted to talk about his matches with Ibushi and Takagi, and also his match with Okada. His matches with Ibushi and Takagi, I feel like, and particularly the match with Takagi, is so widely panned as, like, one of the best matches, one of the best wrestling matches of the year in any promotion. And to me, it was, I can see why people think that, and it really plays to some of Will Ospreay's worst tendencies. And I really saw some very, some minor but significant flaws in that match that kept it from being one of my favorites of the year. And also his match with Ibushi in the G1 was, just totally took me out of my suspension of disbelief. The amount of damage that Will Ospreay's neck takes in that match. And I hope I'm getting the match right. I'm pretty sure it's the match with Ibushi, but I'm not sure on that, so if I'm wrong about that, forgive me, but I'm pretty sure it's the match with Ibushi, where he takes so much damage to his neck. So much damage. I mean, his neck should be shattered into a million pieces, and, you know, he sells it, he grabs it when he does stuff, but he pops up from these moves way too easily, and it just kills my suspension of disbelief. And contrasting that with a match like the one he had with Okada, which was really well done, and I think that's largely to Okada's credit, but also I think that Will Ospreay is a fascinating case because he has so many things that you need to be a great wrestler, He does a lot of the little things. He just does them inconsistently. I think sometimes he can't decide whether he wants to be a superhero or an anime character or a wrestler. A lot of times he ends up just looking like a huge dork and also looking like he's just invincible or just breaking the rules of the physics of the universe that he inhabits, the the spot where he just flipped out of Sonata's Paradise Lock was terrible. It was a good match, but that was that spot was just really bad. You you can't just break that's breaking that's breaking kayfabe in a way that is not fun. It's just it just ruins it. It just ruins everything. It ruins the legitimacy of that move, if you if you can just flip out of it, and you can say, oh, well, it's Will Ospreay, so he's the only one that can do... But 
that move depends on a very specific premise in the physics of the universe that these guys inhabit, and he just broke that rule. Like, you can't do that just because you're quicker and flippier than everybody else. That's not how that hold ostensibly works. So that was a really bad moment. But, I mean, I've seen... I've been a Will Ospreay... Kind of a a little bit of a Will Ospreay hater for a while. And he's impressed me several times by doing some of the things that I hadn't seen him do in other matches. So he can do these things, particularly if he's in the ring with the right guy. But if he's not, he has some really bad tendencies that get brought out by certain guys. And so it's 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 really fascinating. I mean, I, my opinion of him kind of goes back and forth. It's kind of interesting. So yeah, I, I don't want to say too much more about that because I'm coming up on an hour now and I want to keep it under an hour if possible. Let's try to blaze through this. Okay, next up, John Moxley. So, John Moxley's G1 has been interesting. He started out 5-0. and He had an excellent match with Tomohiro Ishii that I was not quite as high on solely because... I mean, the story of the match is great because Ishii wanted... Ishii came out in a press conference and challenged Moxley to have one of those hardcore type of matches. And so they follow up on that really beautifully and they take the match out into the crowd right away. The issue I had with that was it didn't really serve much of a purpose, them going out there. They didn't really do much when they were out in the crowd. I mean, Moxley kind of slammed Ishii's head against a railing or something like that once, and that was kind of it. So it felt really contrived, actually. But also, it it followed up on the story, so it's hard for me to hate that too much. That little flaw kind of kept it from being a top-ranked match for me, the way it easily could have been Um, but still an excellent match and that was kind of the culmination of the hot start for John Moxley in the G1 went 5-0 and to start out and then he had a match with Toru Yano if you know me you know I love Toru Yano they had a match where Yano actually beat Moxley by tying his leg to Shota Umino's leg and causing him to lose by by count out. And there was a very distinct visual moment where Moxley appeared to have some sort of nervous breakdown over this. And after the Yano match, he lost every match after that and ended up finishing the tournament 5 and 4, which is so interesting particularly with the added context from one of the Road to All Out videos that AEW has put out. In one of those videos, John Moxley cut a promo about how the reason he's going to Japan is to prepare for his match at All Out with Kenny Omega, to go over to Japan, the place where Omega made his name, and learn all the tricks of the trade over there, learn all the moves and all the things that, that that Omega learned over there to study Omega in that way. And so it's really interesting because you have to wonder, what did Moxley learn from this? In a tournament where he won his first five matches and then lost via countout, to the biggest joke in all of New Japan, but also a guy like, you know, secretly Yano always is able to spoil a few guys G1 or whatever. He often finds ways of obviously cheating, but he finds ways to score some wins over some really top opponents. He beat Kenny Omega in last year's G1 by doing this. Oh, I didn't even get that connection. Interesting. Both guys now, Omega and Moxley, have both lost to Toru Yano in the G1. Also very interesting. Ooh, I like that little added touch. But also, what did Moxley learn? He went 5-0 and to start the tournament, lost via countout to Toru Yano, joke wrestler, comedy wrestler, via cheating. 
He lost to Jay White via cheating and lost to Juice because he tried to introduce foreign objects and Juice, unlike their first meeting where Juice dropped the U.S. title to Moxley, did not sink to Moxley's level and instead put the tables away, put the chairs away, and won the match his way, which is really interesting. So what what does Moxley learn from all of this? Is he going to cheat in this match with Omega? What is his state of mind going into this match? After winning the, his first five and dropping his last four, what's his mindset going into this match? Which would be really interesting to see how this match at All Out plays out, considering that it's canon that Moxley went to Japan to get ready for his match with Omega. It's going to be really interesting. I know I'm saying that a lot, but it will. And I can't wait to see how that plays out. So next up we have Okada versus Kenta, which is a kind of a lead-in to talk about Kenta a little bit because you can't talk about G1 without talking about Kenta, especially after what happened the other day. But I really enjoyed also Kenta's whole storyline in the G1, which is that he came in essentially as... A foreign wrestler. He came in as a guy who had been doing fairly well in America and then came back to Japan after his time in America. And he had never been, a, he had never been, really been a New Japan guy. He was always a NOAA guy, which is another federation in Japan. And so he didn't get a lot of respect. He definitely, definitely didn't get respect from the fans. And a lot of the wrestlers also didn't respect him very much. Tanahashi very distinctly, dis, not disrespected, but refused to respect Kenta and kind of felt like he didn't belong. And even after Kenta beat him in the G1, Tanahashi refused to shake his hand. Which is really interesting because what I felt was kind of the high point of Kenta's whole story Well, at the time, it was the high point. (laughs) This whole story of Kenta coming in and not really being respected was his match with Okada, where he took Okada to the limit, man. It was a a hard-hitting, bruising match. I loved that match, where Kenta was actually able, and Okada came out before the match and kind of said that he felt like Kenta didn't belong here. And... Over the course of that match, Kenta earns the respect of Okada, and they end up shaking hands. Interesting when you consider that Tanahashi did not shake his hand, because Tanahashi is the wily veteran, and maybe his veteran experience told him, "Mm, there's something not quite right about this guy. But Okada, on the other hand, is a guy who, if you impress him in the ring, he's going to shake your hand, and you're going to earn his respect. So we see later on who was right about that. Tanahashi was. Because ultimately, Kenta, who never got respect from the fans, who never got respect from very many of the wrestlers other than Okada, but the fans especially continued to disrespect him. So, you know what? You're not going to respect me? I'll give you a reason not to respect me. He, he turns his back on his team at the G1 final turns his back on everybody to join Bullet Club, which I thought was just perfect. I mean, it just landed perfectly. And that moment where Katsuyori Shibata comes in and gets fucking pissed and just wails on Kenta, and it was so, so hot. The crowd was so hot. It was great, that whole segment. If you haven't, if you've only heard that he joined Bullet Club, and you haven't actually watched the segment, go back and watch it, because it is incredibly effective on all fronts. So that was great. I think Kenta in Bullet Club is a great move. A lot of people are going back to the old oh, Bullet Club is basically the NWO now, and which kind of is totally ignorant of the actual dynamics of Bullet Club and of factions in general in New Japan. I just That's all I'll say about that. Next up, Ibushi. Ibushi, particularly Ibushi's run of matches at the end of the tournament with Tanahashi, with Okada, and with Jay White were all excellent. 
excellent, excellent, excellent matches. Ibushi runs through the two biggest gatekeepers of New Japan, earns the respect of both guys, has incredible matches with both guys, and has an incredible match with Jay White also. Great storytelling, amazing drama. It's going to be really awesome to see his road to Wrestle Kingdom and see what they do with that because he definitely deserves the IWGP Championship. Next up, Sonata. Sonata's match with Okada for me was the match of the G1, the best match of the G1, and probably the best New Japan match of the year overall. The the story of Sonata just just getting closer and closer and closer every time to beating Okada and finally doing it here and doing it 12 seconds before the time limit. The drama was amazing. It was just an amazing match. Can't speak highly enough of it. But also kind of reminds me of the disappointment of Sonata's G1 and the fact that he was not even close to winning the block. Because a lot of people really thought like that this would be Sonata's year. That he was so hot and so so talented that they were finally going to give him a really big singles push. And a lot of people thought that the G1 was the time that they were going to do that, and they did not. They did not do that at all. Which could be really interesting in terms of this is a big setback for Sonata. He had so much momentum. He nearly beat Okada for the IWGP Championship after... No, for the for the New Japan Cup, I think he nearly beat him for the New Japan Cup. He definitely also nearly beat him for the for the for the championship. This is a huge setback, so it really should be really interesting to see where he goes from here. Especially with Takagi having a breakout, Shingo Takagi's having a breakout year. Tetsuya Naito might be the most popular guy in all of New Japan, which we'll get to in a second. So there's kind of a log jam at the top in Los Ingobernables de Japón, and it, I think it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. And so speaking of Naito, Naito had an excellent, excellent, excellent match with Shingo Takagi also, and however, the real story for me in terms of Naito's G1 is a disappointment. I I and many, many other people really expected... Tetsuya Naito to win this G1 and to go on to Wrestle Kingdom and to finally beat Okada at Wrestle Kingdom. It's been the monkey on his back for so long. People thought he was going to do it two years ago. Not two years ago, but at Wrestle Kingdom last year, I guess it was. People thought he was going to do it at Wrestle Kingdom last year and just been that one thing, that one hump that he could never get over. And this felt like the perfect time to do it. He's talking about his quest to become the first ever double champion with the IWGP heavyweight and intercontinental titles. And it seemed like the perfect culmination to all of these things. But Naito was not even in the final. It was really disappointing. It was really... It's one of the first really significant questionable, significantly questionable decisions I feel New Japan has made since I've started watching. I really want to see where they go with Naito from here. I mean, he's not getting any younger. I think he's 37 now, and there's not much time left on that. And maybe he never will beat Okada. Maybe Okada, because Okada's only 31. So maybe he's just been replaced, and that's the story that they're telling, which feels like a real bummer, but they told the same story with Tanahashi the last, the last couple times they met, so maybe that's, maybe that's what they're going with. So after talking about some of the individual disappointments of the G1, I want to 
end on a positive note here with Shingo Takagi, who, for me, Shingo Takagi was the MVP of the G1. He was the biggest winner of this tournament, other than the man who actually won it, being Kota Ibushi. Had a great match with Naito that I talked about just a minute ago. Had absolute barn burners with Tomohiro Ishii and Hiroki Goto. Especially the match with Ishii. That was just un- unreal. And he beat him so that we may very well get the rematch. Hopefully at Wrestle Kingdom, I think. I, w- I would love to see it at Wrestle Kingdom. Have the rematch between Takagi and Ishii for Ishii's never open weight title. Because, of course, there's the the rule in the G1 tournament that anybody who beats another champion in the G1 is entitled to a shot at their title. And we'll get to all the people who have those. Or you know what, let's just do it now. Sonata, of course, we talked about before, has a, an IWGP heavyweight title match coming his way for beating Okada. The Intercontinental title... Tetsuya Naito lost to Toriano, to Taichi, to John Moxley, and to Jay White. So any of those guys could challenge Tetsuya Naito for the Intercontinental Championship at any time. For Tomohiro Ishii's never open weight belt, he lost to John Moxley, Tetsuya Naito, Hiroki Goto, Shingo Takagi, and Taichi. So Any of those guys could challenge for his belt. Zack Sabre Jr. is the Rev Pro British heavyweight champion, which and he lost to Sonata, Okada, Tanahashi, Evil, and Kota Ibushi. So we could be seeing any of them challenging for that belt, although not likely that they'll win it, being that they are not Rev Pro wrestlers, let alone British wrestlers. John Moxley is the U.S. champion, and he lost to Toriano. Jay White, Hiroki Goto, and Juice Robinson, the latter of which is probably, was definitely the most likely challenger. He actually went to the back after their match, Moxley did, and said that he would give Juice his title shot under one condition, that it be a no disqualification match. So that should be a lot of fun to see. And... The other thing is that also the the briefcase that you win for winning the G1, which holds the contract for the IWGP heavyweight title shot at Wrestle Kingdom, also can be defended against the the people that the winner of the G1 lost to. And Kota Ibushi lost to Kenta in his first match and also lost a match to Evil. So either of those guys, and I have a sneaky feeling that it's going to be Kenta who is going to challenge Kota Ibushi at some point for that briefcase. I guess we're kind of already there, but let's kind of continue on this path of what happens now. Start at the top, Ibushi won. He will face the IWGP Heavyweight Champion at Wrestle Kingdom. Most likely it will be Okada. He has a match at Royal Quest, which is a New Japan show in London, against Minoru Suzuki, but it's not very likely that he'll drop the title in that match. So most likely Ibushi will be facing Okada at Wrestle Kingdom. There's some talk now after Ibushi challenged Naito to a match at Wrestle Kingdom also. It's interesting because he did not he was not one of the people who beat Naito in the G1. He wasn't in the same block. He challenged Naito to an Intercontinental Championship match at Wrestle Kingdom also so that Ibushi instead of Naito could be the first double champion, which is what which is Naito's stated goal. So you know he's not going to be happy about that. So it should be really interesting to see how that plays out. With Naito, it's also, you know, we'll see, you know, it, it could very well be that Ibushi wins the heavyweight title on night one, 
and then drops it immediately the next on night two to to Naito, which would kind of defeat a lot of the purpose of Naito doing that. He really needs to beat Okada at Wrestle Kingdom. But so and there's also it's should be really interesting to see how the leadership in LIJ progresses because Shingo Takagi and Sonata are both very very rapidly rising stars and it should be really interesting to see who how that how that all plays out who could could there be squabbles over leadership of LIJ in the near future so Kenta's in Bullet Club now there's another big thing and he the only thing he has he's entitled to is a shot of that briefcase so I think like I said before he'll probably challenge for that briefcase at some point Shingo Takagi has the rights to a never open weight sh- ch- title shot but I think he'll be I think he'll probably be the guy to do that for the Intercontinental, I think it should be interesting to see who is the guy that challenges for that next. Of the challengers, the the most likely is hard to say. Probably either Moxley or Jay White. I think if I was if I had to bet on it, I would go with Jay White. Probably won't win it from him. And Moxley, I think, is probably not going to be in. New Japan very much going forward. Taichi already had his shot this year, and Toriano, I mean, sure, Toriano might get a shot, but it won't be anything particularly meaningful. I think it's, I think Shingo Takagi is definitely the favorite for the never, the never open weight title shot. And there could be other guys that go for it too. Naito could go for it, Taichi could go for it, but Shingo Takagi is the top candidate, I would say. For the Rev Pro belt, I don't really know, like, any of these guys, or none of them, might challenge for the Rev Pro title. You'd think one of them would have to do it at Royal Quest, although they haven't really set up anything like that. But that would be the perfect time to do it, to have Sonata or Ibushi or even Tanahashi I don't think it'll be evil, and Okada already has a match at Royal Quest, so you'd think it would be Sonata, Tanahashi, or Ibushi. And I don't know which of those guys. If I was, if I, if I was booking it, I think I would probably put Tanahashi in that spot. But Sonata would be great too. Sonata and Saber had a great match when in Dallas. The U.S. title's pretty obvious. Juice is gonna get that title shot. Jay White might also get his sometime down the line, but Moxley's probably going to drop the title to Juice. And I don't know if the... Uh, I, I, I would think that, the, that those title shots that everybody's entitled to would be void at that point. And like I said before, I definitely think Kenta's going to challenge Ibushi for the, for the briefcase at some point. So yeah, so it, once again, I'll, I'll say it one more time. And I swear to God, that'll be the last time you have to hear me say it. I think it'll be interesting (laughs) to see how all of this plays out. And I'm really sorry that this ended up being, like, over an hour and 20 minutes at this point. An hour more than I wanted it to go, and I'm not very good at being succinct, obviously. So we'll see if people like this or not, and hopefully they do. (laughs) So that's, that's everything. This has been... Not really much of a Vunda Blast, actually. Vunda Blast is kind of supposed to be <laughs> short. And this is kind of a Vunda Mega Blast. But I have been your host, D Rock, World Heavyweight Champion, and I'll see you next time. Hey, Vunda. Hey, Vunda. Vundercast? Give yeah. it up for Vundercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Vundercast. What's up, everybody? This is JC David Frank, Green Ranger. You're listening to Boondocast. Oh my God! Check us out Mondays 
on Radiate.fm. Listen to me and Danielle talking about movie reviews and Star Wars and Kylo Ren's nipples. Oh my god. And the Love Shack theme song. Well, it's not a theme song, it's just a Love Shack song by the Beaver But we're going to talk about all those things sometimes on the Flippicast Mondays. Radiate.fm. Tweet us at Flippicast or at Flippicast. Subscribe to the Vondacast.